Right. Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for coming today. So I'm talking to you today about perception of non-standard regional grammar. And the starting point for the talk today is the north-south divide uh, within England. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, it's one of the most significant linguistic distinctions within England. So I'm sure you can think of examples of things people say that might sort of tell you that someone might be from further north or further south. Um, so for instance, um, if you're from further south, you might say bath. Um, if you're from further north, you might say bath. Um, this, this is just one example of, of a sort of linguistic um, ex you know, variable, we can call it, um, that distinguishes north and south. But obviously, the Midlands is part of this and sometimes gets missed out. Um, it's more of a continuum than a divide, right? So um, if you're from the Midlands, I'm sure you can think of things that you say might, that you might share in common with people from further north or further south. But one of the things that's in common with um, when we talk about the north-south divide for language is that often it's to do with accents. So people talk about pronunciation differences rather than other aspects of language. Um, whereas grammatical variation, so the, the structures that we use in different dialects are maybe seen as less of a social marker than phonetic variation. So, um, that's kind of assumed often in the linguistic literature. So this is just one, one reference here, but um, it's often kind of broadly assumed that grammar is maybe a bit more consistent across regions, whereas pronunciation, you can have very fine differences over quite short um, distances. So this is kind of the starting question, uh, one of the starting questions for what I'm going to talk to you about, which is, is the north-south divide as relevant to grammatical variation? We assume it's not, but actually when we look at it empirically, is, is it actually as relevant? Now, the way this has been off, often done in the past in sociolinguistic work and, and dialectology um, with sort of traditional methods is that often people look at one feature at a time. And um, so two famous sociolinguists you might have heard of, J.K. Chambers and Peter Truggill, um, famous people who work in sociolinguistics dialectology, they said one criticism of traditional methods of dialectology is that they tended to treat forms in isolation. So they, they look at one feature of a at a time um, and don't sort of look at the, the whole as, as much. Uh, and also more recent work by um, Moore and Spencer um, says that this tendency, especially for grammatical variables, means that it's very difficult to understand the sociolinguistic work that these grammatical forms can achieve. So basically that we need to consider how different grammatical forms might be used together um, for maybe particular functions within uh, the interaction. So do certain grammatical features tend to co-occur with one another? So um, is, is the starting point. And also, how is this perceived across dialects? So this is basically what I'm going to be looking at today. So uh, sort of an assumption within that is that sometimes grammatical features might co-occur together in the same sentence, say. Uh, and so we can call this co-variation. So it's kind of a correlation between two features. So it could be a grammatical feature, it could be two phono phonological features, but that's what co-variation is, is that two things that you might look at separately actually correlate and pattern together in some way. So those of you who um, came in um, a bit earlier, you, I hand out this leaflet and you might, may or may not have had time to do it yet, um, but the survey that, that's mentioned on the leaflet um, they, it's, it sort of tests, tests your understanding of, of, of tests your, how frequent you find certain sentences to be in your local area. I don't know, did anyone manage to do it before, beforehand? Yeah, a couple of you. So great. So the question, just to sort of get you thinking about this um, a bit further, these sentences all featured in the survey, right? Um, do they all mean the same thing to you? And I think we're going to launch a poll on Zoom as well and ask people there. Um, do they mean the same thing? Um, I don't know, I've got, have I got to answer this oh. or can I close it? <laughs> you can ignore it, I think. Can I just ignore? <laughs> so yeah, um, 
we'll let the people on Zoom answer. But um, anyone in the room, do you have any thoughts? What you, if I move the box out of the way, hang on. Yeah. Did you think these all meant the same thing, or did you think some of them are a bit different in some way? Even if you didn't do the survey, just looking at it now, what do you think? There's no right or wrong answer to this, right? So tell me, tell me what your thoughts are. Are they the same or are they? Yeah, so we've got someone saying, yeah. Anyone think different or? I've used them slightly differently, pragmatic, don't they? Cool, yeah. Can you? I haven't seen yeah. anybody and I ain't seen nobody as you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you think of an example? Or is it just kind of intuitive you think? I haven't seen anybody feels unmarked in any way, but I ain't seen nobody feel like a possible cover. I think I'm trying to like that. Oh, okay, so it's like more of a, I don't know, like more emphasis or something, or more, yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. Katie in the chat has said, um, in the Q&A, has said that they have different emphasis, so she said mm. that as well. Cool, yeah. yeah. Different emphasis, yeah. Cool. 78 people, 78% 78 of people online, I think they all mean the same. Okay, so 78, was it? 78 percent said, yeah. yeah, they mean the same. Okay, cool. So yeah, this, these are the sentences I'm going to talk to you about um, about today. I can move on. Yeah, so they actually, you might notice they have aspects of this core variation that I mentioned before, right? So they, they may or may not have negative concord, which is the first feature that I'm talking about. So some of them or of this, the kind, I haven't seen nothing, right? Where you have two negatives in the sentence, but there's just one negative in the meaning. So something like, I haven't seen nothing is like saying, I haven't seen anything, right? Um, and so in the sociolinguistic literature, it's been found that this is more common in the south of England than in the north or Midlands when this has been looked at um, in various data sets. So it seems to have a north-south patterning of some kind. So next feature ain't. So some of them had ain't, you might have noticed. Um, and there was some talk, talk about how maybe that makes it more emphatic in some way, right? Um, so something like he ain't seen it. Um, this is common, more common in the south and Midlands than in the north, it had been suggested. However, other studies with different data sets actually said, no, it's a bit more mixed. So it's a bit, bit more unclear whether there is a north-south pattern on that one, but some, some research has found that. Um, then there's um, something that's a standard English uh, alternation, which is um, called auxiliary and negative contraction. So um, auxiliary contraction, you contract the verb, so you have he's not been, um, contracted verb, then negative contraction, he hasn't been. Okay, so you, you instead of saying He's not been, he hasn't been. So the not becomes contracted. So this is kind of two standard English alternatives of ain't, right, um, in this context. We've, we've got have, as of all of our examples, I haven't seen nothing, he's not been, he hasn't been. He ain't seen it, the ain't stands for have in that context. Um, so the first two are kind of non-standard stigmatized features, but then the, this next one, you've got two standard English forms. And so one claim in the literature was that, um, so Peter Truggill said, the more north you go within England, the more likely you are to get the auxiliary contraction type. So the more likely to say he's not been, the more north you go, okay? And he says it's particularly true of Scotland as well, outside of England. But when people looked at this in various data sets of, of spontaneous speech, they found actually there wasn't such a clear north-south trend um, and it was a lot more mixed again. So these are the, the features that you saw that were tested in those sentences I showed you. Um, and so the, um, this comes from an ongoing project called Interactions in Grammatical Systems that looks at four cities, um, but the survey that some of you just did is going England-wide, okay? But the data I'm going to be talking to you about today is just from these four cities. Um, so the cities are Southampton in Hampshire, Nottingham, East Midlands, 
Leeds, West Yorkshire, and then Newcastle in the northeast. So we've got a sort of north-south continuum, two northern places, one Midlands, one uh, south. And so the um, data I'm going to be talking to you about today came from participants that were born in um, one of these four cities, um, two different age groups, and they were not, uh, they hadn't moved outside the region very much. They'd, they'd kind of lived in the place most of their life. Um, thought themselves broad, broadly working class and said the way that they talk was generally um, representative of their home town or region. So these um, participants, they actually did um, a sociolinguistic interview. So they, they did a, like an hour long conversation over Zoom um, as one half of the project. And then the other half of the project was a survey that was quite similar in some ways to the one you just did. Um, and we got 74 participants to, to do this um, across the, the four um, places. So there's at least 15 per place, sometimes more um, in, uh, across different age groups. So this survey was done in Google Forms um, with some test sentences, or so the things that, that I'm interested in, and then a bunch of filler sentences. And the sentences themselves had either just one feature of interest, so one of the features I already mentioned to you, um, or two in combination. So this, this is the core variation aspect. So if you've got a sentence like, I haven't seen anybody, um, the participant was asked first, would you use this yourself? Um, how frequently would you hear it in your home city? Um, and that's on a scale of one to five. So the more frequent they thought it was locally, the higher the score, and they'd maybe give it a four or five. Um, if they thought, no, I never would hear that, then they'd give it a one. Um, and then how acceptable, correct, do you think this type of sentence is in speech? Um, you, again, scale of one to five, um, not at all acceptable or correct is one, and then highly acceptable or correct is five. So today I'm going to be talking to you about um, the responses to the second and third um, questions. Starting with the second question, so perceived frequency. So when asked, how frequent do you think this is in your home city? This, these um, plots show the overall distribution of ratings. Okay, so I don't know which screen they're going. Maybe I'll come over this side. Um, so scale of one to five on the bottom. So the, the further the, the data bulks, if you like, towards the right, the more common they find it. Um, and you've got the, the places arranged from north to south as well. Um, so you've got in yellow, the sentence, I haven't seen anybody. Okay, standard English sentence. And then in blue, I haven't seen nobody. So we've got this key at the top, and you've got over here, negative concord is blue um, versus the standard English alternative. So the two essentially the same sentence, but one has negative concord and one doesn't, right? Um, so I'll go through the, the various panels as they come up. We've got another set this time that is essentially the same. So standard English sentence versus um, a negative concord sentence. I've not seen anybody, I've not seen nobody. But the difference is that this first panel you had um, negative contraction, so haven't. Um, whereas with this second panel you've got auxiliary contraction, so it's I've not. Yeah, so that's the, the difference between those two. And then the last one, you, you've got ain't. Okay, so I ain't seen anybody is in yellow. I ain't seen nobody is in blue. Um, so the negative concord one again is it's always in in blue, right? So the blue ones on this panel you combine in two non-standard features together in the same sentence. So what do we broadly see? So it seems like negative concord might be less common in the north because if you look at Newcastle and Leeds, how they judge the negative concord uh, sentences, um, it, they seem to be, the data points seem either quite far to the left, as, as in Newcastle, or in the middle. Um, you see how the, there's kind of like this bulge in the middle for 
leads, for instance, more towards the middle or the left. Um, whereas in Nottingham and Southampton, they seem to have quite similar distributions. So the, you see how the, this is sort of spreading out towards the right. So it seems like their overall distribution is actually a bit higher on the scale. So that it seems like people in the north rate negative concord less common overall. Next thing to take from this is that it seems like aid is less common in the north. Um, so this time we're comparing the right hand panel. And if you just take the sentence I ain't seen anybody, um, you see how for Newcastle, most of the points go towards the left, right? You see the, the left hand side is bigger than the right. So that means you're getting more ones and twos on the scale. Um, Leeds is a bit more in the middle. But for Nottingham and um, Southampton, a bit more towards the right, right? So you see that quite sharply in Southampton where there's this big, big sort of bulge of data, which means a lot of people gave this a four, yeah? So much, much more, perceived to be much more common in the South than the North. What about this claim that auxiliary contraction, so the I've not type, is more uh, common in the north. Well, when you compare across, I've not seen anybody, there doesn't seem to be a huge difference between the places. If you just look at the shape of the yellow, the yellow plots, they look the same. So it doesn't seem like there's any kind of clear north-south trend in this particular feature. Lastly, on this one, what about the co-variation? So this is the combination of two features in the sentence. Well, it seems like generally the use of negative concord makes people rate these sentences as less frequent um, or that there's sort of less consensus, um, as you see here. So say in Newcastle, a sentence like, I haven't seen anybody, people find that acceptable. Most people give it a five, but um, uh, sorry, wait, wait, more frequent. And then with negative concord, it's rated much less frequent, right? You see how the, the blue becomes like long and thin. Um, so the, the distribution shifts to the left, but there's also a bit less consensus in it. However, that's not necessarily true when you have ain't a negative concord. So the sentence we were talking about before, that I ain't seen nobody, you're combining two non-standard features together. And it seems like if you have I ain't seen anybody and I ain't seen nobody, they're kind of rated quite similarly. Um, and if, if you see that with the green um, for, for Newcastle, similarly or even, you know, it just doesn't seem to make much of a difference, right? You see that the, the distribution looks the same um, across the yellow and the blue. Okay. So that was perceived frequency. What about perceived correctness? So if you ask someone how correct or acceptable do you find this in speech, what do they say? Um, and you see some similar results actually. So AIN seems to be low on correctness. So if you just compare, them, if we just focus on the yellows, I ain't seen anybody, you see how for every place, the distributions are kind of fatter at the left-hand side than the right-hand side, um, which means people find this low, low for correctness. Um, then negative concord. Um, again, adding negative concord often seems to make ratings lower. Um, so like Southampton over here, you, you see um, most of the data, data points are a two, because um, there's a sort of bulge over the two there. Um, but in Nottingham, there seems to be less consensus. So you see um, here, um, Nottingham, it's very long and thin, which means people don't agree in their ratings. So some people are at a one, some people are at a five. Um, the most common rating was a three, but it's sort of a little bit more spread out. Cool variation. So it seems like, again, a bit similar to what we saw before, um, negative concord is more acceptable with ain't um, in, in Nottingham. 
slightly higher more rating, slightly higher ratings, more consensus in Southampton. So basically, you see this here where um, I ain't seen anybody, the, the sort of median, that's the line there, um, is a two. But if you add negative concord, so I ain't seen nobody, um, it shifts to the right. And actually then the median, most common, the sort of middle value is a three. Um, so it improves the acceptability rating. Um, but the same combination of features seems to decrease correctness in the north. Okay, So the same exact same sentences, um, if you compare Newcastle and Leeds, um, it actually seems that um, negative concord makes things worse um, in terms of perceived correct correctness. Um, so you see that in Newcastle with the sort of big bulge at the left hand side. Um, and then in Leeds, a bit more similar, but um, the distribution as a whole um, is a little bit more shifted slightly um, to the left. Okay, so that's the kind of overview of the findings. Now, what we often do in sociolinguistics is we do kind of statistical modeling to like, figure out what the most um, significant factors are in the variation. Um, so I'm not going to go into lots of detail about that, but what I thought I'd show you is the kind of overview of when we test this, this, all these factors together, what comes out as the most significant um, in terms of patterns. So what came out was that negative concord is generally rated less frequent and less acceptable than the standard. Um, it's also rated less frequent in Newcastle than everywhere else um, and more acceptable, more correct in Nottingham. So you see this regional um, difference emerge. And somewhat similar, um, less frequent, less acceptable, same as negative Concord, but it was also rated less frequent in Newcastle and that was the sort of statistically significant um, distinction. And then lastly, with the core variation, negative concord plus int was rated more frequent than the two things in isolation and was also rated more acceptable. So if you have two non-standard things in the sentence, it was rated more acceptable than if you just had one, um, which is quite, quite an interesting uh, finding. One thing that didn't come out was that you notice that um, the contraction, the two standard English contraction types, like I haven't and I've not, no difference, right? No significant difference between them um, in, in this data. So what does all this mean? So in terms of the regional distribution, there was some existing claims in the literature of north, south, or north, middle, and south patterns for ain't and for negative concord that weren't fully supported in the data, but we saw that region was still relevant. It actually seemed like when we looked at the plot, especially for the frequency ratings, that there was some north versus middle and south patterning. But in the statistical modeling, the most significant distinction was Newcastle versus elsewhere. So it's not a straight north, middle and south pattern because Newcastle and Leeds weren't were distinguished in the model. And Leeds actually statistically patterned more like the Nottingham and Southampton data. We also saw the acceptability ratings, so correctness ratings, did vary by location. So for instance, the Nottingham speakers found negative concord more acceptable. So for all we may think of these as kind of non-standard stigmatized things that everybody finds incorrect with, you know, with and negative concord, actually people's perceptions of them do vary. Then with co-variation, we saw that combining stigmatized features together in the same sentence increased frequency and acceptability ratings compared to when those features were just on their own in the sentence. So the more non-standard features, at least these ones, the less the effect of prescriptive norms. So we, we know that these are non-standard, you know, they're not part of standard English and, and negative concord, but when they're together, 
people perceive them as more frequent, more acceptable. So, and also it's interesting that frequency and acceptability largely patterned hand in hand. So it seems like if we're familiar with something, we find it more acceptable. Whereas if you were present, maybe if you were presented with a sentence of something you'd never heard of, never heard anybody say, you would find it less correct, right? So this, this is kind of a, an interesting, kind of cool variation in itself, I guess, a kind of parallel between the two. Um, and just in terms of the sort of social meaning, in a negative concord and some other stigmatized features, so in the questionnaire, I also looked at um, non-standard were, so if you say I were instead of I was, um, and Eckert flagged all three of these features as kind of things that have quite fixed social meanings linked to things like um, class, so possibly working class speech, possibly ethnicity, depending on the community. And it's possible that when we see these kinds of features in combination in a sentence, um, at least for these participants who were working class participants, it maybe makes them think of a kind of working class local persona, if you like. Um, and this might in some way have a form of covert prestige, right? So we know that in an overtly prestigious, they're not part of standard English, um, but they seem to have some kind of covert prestige for these particular people leading to greater recognition. So just the main take home points today, the North South Midlands patterning of grammatical variables is not so clear cut, but not completely irrelevant because we saw this new castle versus the rest distinction. And later George is gonna to talk to you about phonological variables and how they pattern regionally and you know, they can have very various different distributions as well. Um, and what we see is that participants don't attend to language features in isolation, um, but that this core variation of stigmatized non-standard features can lead to greater recognition and acceptability. And that's it. So um, thank you very much for listening. And I think now we're gonna to move to activities, right? right.